Roxo Media House. Welcome back to Fortitude, folks. J.W. Wilson with that kid over there, Britton Payne. Do you feather well, your hair these days? I don't. No, I don't. It Just looks feathered. cut it in it's a while, nice. but thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, we want to thank Captex Bank, our sponsor for a long time. Mike Thomas, we know you're out there staying up late, loaning money. Yeah. Uh, the guy in the middle here, Brenton, pretty cool guy. I've known him for a while. I know you have as well. He's got quite the story. Mr. Uh, Clint Weber, how are you, Clint? Good, thanks With for having B, me. With one B, right? Only one, one B. B. How do you, how do you how does one feather their hair? <laughs> Yours is kind Please, of feathered yes. too. Feathered as well. Those who don't have hair tend okay. to be a little I bit enamored noticed, with the uh, with noticed. the cuts. No, it looked robust. Um, that used to be an old robust. an old eighties thing. You know, yeah, back yeah, when yeah, the, yeah. Mr. T had like the feather uh, earrings, yeah. but it was a real popular. I don't know how it's actually done. I do remember going to a salon at one time and asking for a, a feathered a, cut. A, yeah. Please okay. continue. I, mean, I, I, think yeah. it was, I think it's very it's right. very resembling of what you both are sporting Thank today. You. Well, we have Thanks Clint here today, but versus your hair, we'll stick with Clint <laughs> for this particular yeah. part of the interview. I love it. So Clint currently is the president and CEO of the Catholic Diocese of Fort Worth Advancement Foundation, right. which we'll get into towards the end of this uh, interview. But you've been there for three years. But until we get to that point, we want to start at the beginning, kind of your childhood, sure. where you grew up, and how the story all in, in, unfolded in front of you. But where did you? Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Gosh, um, you know, I was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, in 1976. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. So, um, you, you know, Tripler Army Medical Center. Everybody referred to it as the Pink Hospital. Kind of sits up on a hill right above Honolulu, um, uh, on the island of Oahu. Obviously, my uh, parents had just recently been married uh, and had left College Station, Texas. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think uh, back in the early 70s, things were a little different back then. So, you know, if you're going to get married, you need to get a job right. to support your family. And um, um, you Novel know, the, concept, yeah, Clint. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. 36 years later, the, my, my dad finally retired from the Marine Corps. So I grew up in a Marine Corps military family, but mm-hmm. always from Texas. Right. Uh, and so, um, you know, we kind of lived all over. I went to... 11 different schools, Um, uh, did some elementary school at Aiken Elementary School in Paris, Texas. So my my mother's from East Texas, so I got a little 903 area code in my blood. (laughs) Right. And then uh, my father is from Abilene, Texas. Okay. Or grew up there. What uh, was your dad's uh, time in the in the Marines like? What, what was he? What was his role? He uh, he left Texas A and M University in 1972. Interesting time to be at Texas A and M. Maybe not the most popular time to be mm-hmm. at A and M there right. towards the end of the Vietnam War. But uh, uh, you know, well, I, I'll just I think it's probably it's I've always thought it's an enter- entertaining story. So his class or year group, they were um, all ROTC Army ROTC. And they, um, so meant they were going to go in as army officers as soon as they finished yeah. up uh, school. And I want to say at the end of their junior year, uh, the U.S. Army came out, de-Vietnamization was going on. So the army was shrinking, all the military was shrinking mm-hmm. down. We're starting to withdraw from Vietnam. And they told these guys, hey, look, you don't owe us any money, but you're not going to have a job. No kidding. And so, and they had kind of been planned on, you know, all, all going into the army and so, you know, a couple of these guys, dad and a couple other of his friends, you know, what are we going to do? My gosh, there wasn't a whole lot to do back in college or college station back then. And so the way they, they say it is uh, the Marine recruiter or officer selection officer came over from Austin. And for some reason, the U.S. Marine Corps was giving out one year contracts back then. And so, uh, yeah, he put some uh, John Wayne movies on, rented out a little hotel, filled it up with pearl beer and ice, and signed four of them up for the Marine Corps. Oh, no wow. kidding. Nice. On wow. a one-year contract. So I uh, got this is yeah. going to be this is a terrible question, but is the core at A and M different than the ROTC? Like, could you do ROTC at A and M but not you, be part of the core? You cannot do ROTC at Texas A and M without being a part of the core cadets, which okay. makes it unique. Yeah, so was your dad regard. part of the core? He was. Okay. In fact, well, I mean, nineteen sixty-eight. I don't think you, I think you had to be. Mm-hmm. They may have changed that as he was there. Yeah, yeah. So, so then yeah. what about his father? Like, do you, do you have it all yeah. the way? Like, talk about that lineage. The yeah, so there. my grandfather uh, was class of 1950. Mm. Um, interesting. Uh, you know, so my dad's side of the family is, is the Catholic side of the family. And uh, they were originally German immigrants in the early 1900s and moved to central Michigan. Like a lot of Germans did. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of Germans that moved to Central Texas. Mm-hmm. 
Um, well, after World War II, the big family, family of nine, both the mom and dad had died. So after World War II, it, it, what, what you used to see a lot was the fam- the kids would split up. Yeah. The two oldest siblings would take half the younger kids right. and, the, you know, and they would split them. So one of the siblings took four of the kids, my grandmother, and they moved to Central Texas because, you know, they, they drove south. They were looking for a kind of a new opportunity, a new place. And you get to Central Texas and in 19, oh gosh, probably 42, 43, when the AM radio's on and there's polka music and people are speaking German. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so um, my uh, great uncle and who was taking care of my grandmother and brought her down became the town doctor in Schulenburg, Texas, right there on I-10. So Excellent. that's kind of where the, his family comes from. So yeah. maybe a little bit more than you wanted to know. But so my grandfather, who married my grandmother, was a naval aviator in World War II. And um, uh, in, in when he when the war finished, uh, he flew Avengers and Helldivers, uh, went, went back to college and, and wanted to get an engineering degree and went to Texas A&M. And, and then, uh, immediately following that, you know, when you get an engineering degree at Texas A&M, you go out to the oil field in 1950. So he moved his family out to Abilene and that's where my, okay. my okay. parents, that's where my father grew up out there. I bet Perfect. he saw some stuff and obviously you're, you, you knew early on in your life, probably where your, where your trajectory was heading based on your dad's military you know, service I, and where he wanted to be. Maybe I think I did, you know, I look back on that now and I try to think about that. I was having a conversation about that the other day. I don't know if you guys remember where you were, where we were talking about college a yeah. couple of minutes ago, but I mean, when I was in college, I was on a, on a Marine in ROTC C scholarship. Right. Uh, I, I guess I probably wanted to be like my dad. I, I mean, I think that was certainly the case, but I mean, in college, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I look back on it now and all my friends were trying to get into the business program and taking finance yeah. classes and thinking about, well, I'm going to go home and run the family business. None of that crossed my mind, man. I mean, I was, I got to get this degree, spend as much time in the Dixie Chicken as I can and as little yep. time in <laughs> class as I can in order to get this degree to go fly airplanes. Certainly. So that, that was, was the it. goal, to fly airplanes. That was it. Yeah. That yeah, was yeah. it. And as you can tell by that piece of bling on his finger, he he completed the task, Yo, got, yeah. got through there. Yes, indeed. So I got to drink the beer with the ring yeah. in it. Don't hold it against me. Don't yeah. Against St- me. Straight to the Marines from there. I did. I, I was uh, I finished up. I, you know, like I said, I, I struggled a little bit early on. So I was four years in a summer school period, I had to take okay. a, a class. So I graduated technically in I know August. What you're saying, so. you, you understand? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's nothing. So, yeah. It's, yeah. So it's four, four and some change in college. And then, uh, so I graduated uh, in August of 2000, uh, excuse me, 1998. And then, um, then graduated, then walked uh, over to the quadrangle, uh, put my Marine Corps uniform on, was commissioned. And two days later, got in a pickup truck and drove to Quantico, Virginia. Incredible. Man. For the next 20 years, he, you're going to spend with the Marines, and it, and it progressively gets better. And I've known you enough to know a little bit about your story, but I'd like, love if you could share. But you become a naval aviator. I mean, that's right. You, yeah. you attend uh, Weapons and. T- Weapons and Tactics Squadron 1 or Marine Aviation Weapons and Tactics Squadron 1, WTI, mm-hmm. uh, which is the equivalent in the Marines of Top Gun for the Navy, which is incredible. Can you walk us briefly through the, the progression from Marines to, to that point? Sure. I'll uh, Let me try and do that. And you guys just cut me off, I guess, if I, you know. We only I have two hours, Clint. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, I gotta be, I gotta be out of here before then. So. Feathered hair again, you'll know that's your that's it. That's the that's, gong show that's the, cane. Got thing. it. And yeah. I am surprised. I must say, I am surprised. Being born in Honolulu, yeah. you didn't get a surf question from Britain because he definitely. I was thinking it, but we've moved on. Okay, okay good. I'm trying to, to yeah. temper the okay. impulse. Please continue. Sorry, you bet. So um, when you when you join the Marine Corps as an officer, you go up to Quantico. All the Marine officers go up to Quantico. Um, the guys that have the aviation contract, I always thought we were really lucky because. Once again, you know, I got six months of training to do that's, I'm sure, great training, but it's a check in the box because I got to get down to Pensacola, Florida to learn how to start flying airplanes. Mm-hmm. And when you how go How long? To, how long between uh, Quantico to Pensacola? It's about, well, you, there's some t- waiting time in there, so it's about nine months, but it's about yeah. six months of training. Okay. And so, in, in, you know, it's up there in the, you know, Quantico Hills or Highlands. The FBI's got a training center up there, too, and- and, and you do some great training. You meet some great people. Right. It's the first time you meet people from all over the United States. And that was Bump all. Bump into Jody Foster at all there? Jody Foster. Yeah, at the beginning of. Um, Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati football uh, player. 
No, no, no he's Jodie Foster. He's actress. singing Silence from, of the Lambs. Oh, no, 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 no. She did a training. I do know there. Jodie Foster. <laughs> he, was a, he was, but I don't know her. Backfire. <laughs> I don't know her. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry. no, no. Great, great question. Yeah, relevant, thank you, thank relevant. you, thank yeah. you. Uh, so we, um, so you know, we did that, but but once again, I found myself in a position where it was, okay, what do I need to do? Kind of, what do I need to do to get through this thing to get where I need to be? Yeah. And, um, which was unique because that's a very competitive environment because most guys go to the basic school and they don't know what they're going to do in the Marine Corps. So there's a lot of competing test taking. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, in, in a lot of different ways. And I, I never worried about that. Sure. You know I mean, it was, uh, you know, uh, you had an air contract. So I spent a lot of time in Georgetown, a lot of time, uh, over in Baltimore mm-hmm. outside Johns right. Hopkins. Yeah. Um, uh, the college scene up there. Finished that and then uh, married my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we started dating during that time period. Where'd she uh, go to school, by the way? She went to Westminster College. Oh, the my Fighting God. Blue Jays. Who, who, the who Fighting Blue Jays. I, give, I get so much for that <laughs> no. stuff. Great. Yeah. So Thank we, you. We knew each other from our se- my senior high school, which okay. is a different story. Uh, and just had, it, bottom line is, Friendship, co- you know, became a, a a real relationship. I think she would say that. And then you guys uh, just visiting each other. Yeah, like, yeah. And then we. Where was uh, she living? Oh, she was. She was in in Westminster. Oh, oh, and Fulton. you would go back. Okay, she was yeah. in Fulton. Yeah, and so she would. They come weren't up and, zooming, Britain. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there was no zooming. That's yeah. right. Yes. In fact, there was the there was the phone booth with the the phone the card. Do you remember that? We're like yes. you recharged the card. <laughs> yeah. So for the young people that they, they probably true think romance crazy. starts yes. that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. A different era. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, did that. Enjoyed my time in Quantico. Got married and then went down to Pensacola. And I, I tell people that's kind of certainly becoming a Marine was a great honor for me. My father was a Marine. He was an artillery officer. But I wanted to fly airplanes as well. And right. so to get down to Pensacola and check in down there and actually start that process, that that's mm-hmm. when it was the competition level started to sure. ratchet up a little bit. Sure. Yeah. It was like a Top Gun. Like, was it like a scene? Like, was it like all those guys? Like, did you run into Iceman there? I'm trying to think of the character you yeah. would be in this, Clint. Who, yeah, I don't, who, I don't know that. I'm goose, gonna, well, maybe? Keep, keep thinking about that. Okay. <laughs> Ho- hopefully I'm not Goose. But, yeah, you know. yeah. But uh, the competition, I mean, I yeah, mean is no, it every day? Like, you're in a really... You are. I mean, you're in an environment every day. There are a lot a lot of very bright people that are there. Great yeah. athletes. Um, a lot of folks in naval aviation. I don't know why it, it, this is the case, but I, it seemed like half the Navy football team was there. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, we got Division One athletes right, right. that yeah. are pretty... I mean, a lot of type A personalities. Yeah. Um, uh, so, very bright people. I mean, I... Texas A&M is Harvard on the Brazos River, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. But it's probably not the same thing as yeah. Harvard. Now, Any so, flight experience prior to never that? Never touched an airplane. Just knew you wanted to fly. Never touched an but airplane. But you could have gotten there and then said, hey, your eyesight's off in one eye, done. That's right? it. That's it. And they use a lot of those, what they call them physiological factors. Basically what happens is managing the population of pilots in the Navy and the Marine Corps is challenging mm-hmm. because the pipeline's so long. Right, so it's right. like a basically a supply chain problem. Sure. Yeah. And... um and so because of that, the way that they manage that, right, wrong, or indifferent, and it doesn't really matter if it's fair, but they'll they'll change the criteria. Mm-hmm. So the criteria might be 2030 or 2040, but if they don't need any pilots next year, they'll just ramp that thing up to 2020, oh, yeah, perfect right. eyesight, yeah. Yeah. and then wash a bunch of people out. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of risk and kind of chance that goes with it, too. Yeah, and, you but know. it was probably a really intense time. You just got married, but I would imagine that you were living a life where you're like, I got to be on, like... Every yeah. day, all the time, right? Well, I think one of the things, I, what I would say is, you know, whether or not I was a good pilot or not, I'd leave, I mean, I don't know. I'd leave that up to other people to, to, to decide. But but I do know this, there were individuals that were natural at it. Um, and they tend to be natural pilots that are really good. Fighter pilots tend to have a kind of a, 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 a very interesting and superior decision-making process. Mm-hmm. Great mm-hmm. quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. Sure. They're like great quarterbacks. You would not put yourself in that mm-hmm. category? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'd let somebody else make that decision, but that was my assessment. Sure. It wasn't necessarily about IQ. Uh, it was really more about confidence, mm-hmm. uh, work ethic, willing to work hard, sure. and then um, being able to make decisions with confidence on a timeline. Right. 
super and, and fast, right? That's yeah. right. It's and like then, doctors, you know, some of those doctors are the same way. They just, it's yep. like, how did you make that? I would have pondered over like just, and well, then you think, well. and if, and if you make a mistake, it's just gone. Yeah. It's gone. So you're right sure. on to the next thing. Like a, you know, like yeah. a, a, one of our yeah. questions or one of my questions about this was I'm asking you to kind of talk about yourself yeah. in that deep, but what made you uh, able to do this at that high level? Like what, 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 what inside of you, Clint, and what makes you uh, able to handle this kind of pressure, which is a lot. I mean, you're, uh, you're a natural born leader. I know you're a smart guy, but what, 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 what do you, what do you excel at that makes you able to do these things? Well, was, that's a good question. I think the Naval aviator that excels, that's the jet pilot, mm-hmm. Navy or Marine Corps, pretty much the same, um, is the individual. There is something about, um, I hate to say it, but there's a work ethic that goes with it. And then there's a level of fear of failure mm-hmm. or fear of letting other people down mm-hmm. inside of the culture right. that is the ready room, mm-hmm. which is yeah. the place where we all, you know, or, or, or to be quite honest with you, the bar mm-hmm. that we, the officers club, um, fear of failure, feel letting people down in that environment supersedes everything that else. That makes sense. Everything. Well, and then let me ask you, how many of those guys came from a similar heavy military upbringing like you did, too? I mean, was yeah. it? Probably a majority, but not all. You'd be yeah. surprised. Yeah. You know, fair amount of guys. Um, you know, some of the guys, and that's just the, there are the natural pilots are the guys that just, they love to fly, and they're still flying today. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I haven't touched an airplane since 2018, which mm-hmm. you know, it's, maybe we'll get to that, maybe we won't. But but the... the, the, the um, there were guys that that knew they did their research and they just knew I want to be in right. the air and the quickest way to, and the cheapest and the quickest mm-hmm. way to get there flying the coolest and the best airplanes is yeah. in, the, in the military. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Know, how would you how would you describe flight school and that and that level to the general person doesn't know much? Yeah, yeah. Is there a way to do that? Um, yeah, I'm sure it's probably pretty close to the same or relative to the way everything else is today. And you know when you think about uh, what it is today, but. You know, 20 something years ago, it was um, pretty intimidating. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'd mentioned, everybody's kind of there. Everybody's eyeballing everybody else. Right. Um, I think the very first thing you do is they put you in a flight suit and you do a mile swim. Oh, wow. You know, which is kind of interesting because swimming a mile is, you got to be a decent swimmer. In the ocean. Mm-hmm. No, in a pool, actually. An really? Olympic pool. You know, Pensacola, I just read, has one of the largest indoor pools there. For like, well, and they, We were and swimming it, in it. That's the Pensacola yeah. Center, I guess, is the name yeah. of it. Yeah, and so we did a bunch of other stuff, you know, right. a lot of water-based stuff. But that one, that and the Hilo Dunker that, that turns you upside down and yeah. you got to get out of there. Did that you have thing. a helmet on when you had to do the mile you'd, swim? Uh, you have a helmet on and you had a flight suit on. Brutal. Yeah. And, um, but it was funny because you know, you talk about just the intimidation factor of a guy like me. I mean, I was a pretty decent swimmer. Sure. I'd grown up in and around the ocean. So, I mean, I'll swim the freestyle for the first 200 meters. How quickly then, we go to the dog. Yeah. <laughs> I would say the back, a little the back, side the back, stroke, yeah, back, yeah, yeah. a lot of backstroke, yep. back yeah. over to the breaststroke, yeah. mix it up a little bit. Right, right. Maybe float a little bit towards the end, you know, Yo, catch yeah. your breath. Well, there was one guy there who was an, a water polo player from USC. Ooh. Swam the whole thing freestyle. Finished. I mean, I think it probably took me like at 55 minutes, if I remember, right, right that, under There's now. your ice man right there. This guy mm-hmm. swims it in like 18 minutes. That's right, Clint. I am dangerous. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, so that was the general experience in Pensacola. There was a weed out process. It was the, uh, it was the, you know, the eyes, the, you know, the physiology, mm-hmm. um, doing a bunch of stuff that, that really didn't have a whole heck of a lot to do with flying, but just trying to determine whether or not right. you really wanted to be there. And then from there, they sent me to Corpus Christi and that's where I learned how, that's where I flew my, flew my first airplane. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. How long does that take from day one till when? That was probably eight weeks. That's it. Uh, through through that, it was a, there was some there was some uh, did some weather classes that you, and you had to, I think you had to make like an I, I can't remember the grades, but a lot of folks flunked out of it. Weather yeah. classes, engineering classes, uh, classes on uh, just basics of like an, a jet engine or yeah. a turbine engine, and then the the physiology. And mm-hmm. a lot of people just don't like being in the water. Yeah, and they just. You know, they, so what kind of flew. plane was the first one you flew? First airplane I flew was a T-34 Mentor. 
tur, tur, yeah, turbo mentor. They, we used to call it the tour mentor. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that uh, a trainer or something? Was well, it's basically a beach craft. Uh, it's a little tandem two seat front. The instructor was in the back. Um, student was up in the front. Had about 1,100 shaft horsepower. Go about 220 miles an hour. Right. Um, fully aerobatic. So you go, and that was the kind of the cool thing. The first mm-hmm. airplane you get in is retractable, retractable, retractable gear, high performance airplane. Right. Like it's got this stick. Like you just, oh yeah, whoosh. oh yeah, that's right. Probably just that's like right. that. Yes, friend. Yeah, yeah. It's just like the in the sounds <laughs> just a like lot, sounds a lot like that. Too. Yeah, that yeah. sound right there. You go ahead your, and amp that up, Joel. <laughs> for the you, uh, you worked production. your way up to I know at least the F eighteen Hornet, yeah. which is I know a little bit about this plane, but. <laughs> dumb question but what does it feel like to be behind the the, the throttle or the stick of a f-18 hornet hold tight clint yeah. how do you know a little bit about this plane dude? i happen to From like airplanes pre- previous experience i've been to a few yeah. air shows no i've never been in one but i go to the air show <laughs> okay sorry yeah, yeah, f-18 yeah. hornet so we eventually worked our way up there i will tell you that the probably the most i guess the best story if there's a story about learning how to fly the f-18 and tyler head and i talk about this a lot because mm-hmm. That's what eventually brought me back to Fort Worth. Was my Tyler relationship from with Corbett him. Capital? Yeah. Okay. Wait, yeah. Tyler flew too? He did. Robert? Uh, no, his his older brother, Tyler oh. Head. Robert, oh yeah, but, Robert's his little brother. But, but then the but Alban did too, right? Alban yeah. did too. Now he was a P three guy. Yeah. So any uh, other names you want to drop? Real no, quick? but yeah. he can't because Alban can't talk. We shouldn't even be talking about Alban. Like yeah. I don't even know if he exists anymore in the stuff he's flying. You know? Yeah, he, okay. He, so. Um, uh, Tyler and I were talking about this uh, uh, dinner the other night, but you know, in, on September 11th, 2001, I was in the ready room. I had just had my first simulator and the simulator experience was that's where you know, for the F-18 is where you kind of the dose of reality starts coming in. Mm-hmm. I think my simulator instructors were all Vietnam era guys. Several of them had been shot down. Several of them had been prisoners of war. Uh, they were all friends with John McCain, you know, uh, and so there were some really incredible stories. Yeah, yeah. And that's where you realized, OK, you know, sure. we're in an airplane now being trained by guys that that I mean, these guys are pretty mm-hmm. salty. Yeah, pretty yeah. salty. So I just had my first simulator and I was standing duty September 11th, 2001. And um, it's a training squadron on on a but a, but on a base with fighter squadrons mm-hmm. it's uh oceana naval air station oceana in virginia right. beach and um man i'll never forget it the tv's on i think they had it on whatever it was cbs or nbc and what are you guys in the galley or something like we're sitting out in, in the, the ready room and i'm and i'm the duty oh, yeah. officer so i'm um, airplanes are checking out they go fly well they check out on the radio before they go fly and i put yeah. their little thing up on the board okay airborne the time you know the oh, co man. comes by and he says hey how many airplanes do we have airborne so it's that kind of a thing a right. d- duty officer role. serious stuff yeah and um and so we're watching this happen and before anybody on tv starts talking about what this could even be i get a there there was a it was called a crash phone and uh, it was in every Navy and Marine Corps squadron, and it's a red phone. It's like a bat phone, and the tower runs it along with base operations. Right. And the crash phone rings. When the crash phone rings, you pick it up, you give your two initials. They're, they verify because they have the duty schedule. They verify that you're the guy that's supposed to be on duty. CW. And that's right, CW, Charlie Whiskey. Oh, and you got to do it that you way. You got to do Charlie Whiskey. Okay. And then they said, um, uh, hey, recalling all of the airplanes. And um, so brought all of the airplanes back in and then get with the squadron commander, recall all of the officers in the squadron. So I spent the next 45 minutes calling everybody at home that had had the day off or wasn't right. scheduled, prioritizing the instructors, which I didn't really understand at first. Well, mm-hmm. come to find out um, 15 minutes later, I'm coordinating live air to air missiles to come in to put on these training airplanes. They canceled the whole training schedule and our instructors took off and they were the, the guys that were flying over the top of Washington, D.C. And with, that was live, a, with live and, and what you were oh being trained. That's right. Yeah. Because we didn't know it at the time, but the Pentagon thing had just happened as well. Yeah. And so this squadron um, was the, was this because it had some older instructor savvy yeah, guys yeah. That, that was assigned to go do that. And I look back on that now and that changed everything. Yeah. Because before that, we thought we were going to go on Westpac and it was going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, maybe, you know, we're really going to fight the Chinese in 1998. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, the Ru- 
the Russians were, it was just, it was different yeah. back then Yeah. in 2001. And that changed it all. And that was it. That's what kind of what, what, what probably created the, the career path that, that sure. you think, that um, anything prepares you for like a moment like that, or think about even, you talked about the history of the guys who were the yeah. trainers that like, clearly they had a tenure that they knew, you know, it's like when things get serious real fast, like, mm-hmm. well, nope, this isn't kidding around. You think anything prepared you for something like, like if all the training and stuff, you know, no? I, I would imagine. Yeah. Well, so, so the training is the key to naval aviation. That's what gets you. That's what keeps you alive at the back yeah. of the ship at night. Yeah. Without a doubt. Training is, is, is second to none. At the end of the day, you know, I hate to say this, but when you're, this is the reality. It's the nature of the ready room or the type of people that are there. Yeah. When you're 22 years old and you're in that environment, mm-hmm. this is, I mean, it's like Christmas morning. Oh, in a right. sense. Yeah. 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 It's like, you know, we're going to go get these guys. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to those old guys like that to too. That. The instructors where you, could you feel it from them a little bit too? They like, were a little different. They were serious little different. stuff. Yeah. The serious yeah. stuff. Well, yeah. So Clint, you yeah. just you just opened the door for that, but you you saw a combat as a, as a naval you led a naval squadron, right? Yep. Uh, you, did you see combat? I flew. Uh, you know, I did five deployments. JW, I did three in Iraq, okay. so it's not an Afghanistan what guy. Year, but what I was years in Iraq, in Iraq was that? I was in Iraq from roughly two thousand and five mm-hmm. to two thousand and eight. I spent about sixty seventy percent of the time over there during those wow. three years. In the three deployments, you said I did. I did. How many uh, flights are we talking about in during the three? Oh, I probably have about twelve hundred hours of 1200. flying over there. So it's probably six seven hundred sorties. And this is where I mean, you're already separating the men from the boys. Forgive the lack yeah. of a better description, but when you're flying in a combat zone during an a, a actual conflict with with live ammunition, then it's like the real deal, right? And it, not, not to not to delineate from uh, yeah. the, the September 11th, but you're over there in that. What what's what's feeling? I know your training is everything, but what does that feel like internally to be part of something like that? I mean, you feel, I think we all felt a lot of pride mm-hmm. being a part of a, um, you know, being regardless of what you think about it now. Okay, looking back on it at the time, we were well prepared. We had a lot of pride mm-hmm. in. Uh, we had a lot of trust in each other. Yeah. Had a lot of trust in the young Marines that were fixing the airplanes for us. Um, and um, we were over there doing, you know, what we felt like was our part. They write that stuff with the Sharpie on the missiles and stuff. They, they do. All that? They do write the mm-hmm. stuff. With the, with the so what you're taking off from, from a base in Iraq or mm-hmm. are you in Kuwait or is it, is it, we Iraq? were in a Western Iraq, an air, air base called Al Assad, which was actually built by the, uh, the money was, from the United States, built by Saddam Hussein in oh, wow. probably early 80s. I mean, this, yeah. this, this air base is a 18,000 foot runway. Oh my gosh. Three, triple, right? I mean, you could see right. it from 100 miles away mm-hmm. out in the middle of the desert. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, it was a heck of a facility. And it was, but you also saw it was, a, it was an interesting uh, place to fly out of because history was frozen in time. And so what do I mean by that? You'd walk past a um, reinforced concrete hangar that you knew that we, the Americans, had probably provided money for to be built. Yeah. And there would be a giant 30-foot hole in it where somebody dropped a 6,000-pound laser-guided bomb through it yeah. in yeah. 2003, you yeah. know, two years prior. Yeah. And you knew mm-hmm. that was an American aviator that did that. And then you would fly right past. And then as you walk past further, you'd see like a literally a broken down MiG-21. Right. It was a Russian airplane that they had bought probably in the 19th. So it was just... It's it was, crazy. Well, like yeah. Now you're making the Pandora's boxes beginning, man. Like this is... Mm. Well, it makes you start like... Uh, it may, You know, it makes one that has an inquisitive mind start to ask questions like, why does the Middle East look like it does? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know? Did you learn a lot, you think, going over there? I'll bet you learned to appreciate Tremendous a lot. Tremendous amount mm-hmm. about the culture, about the area, the region, mm-hmm. the country of Iraq, which difficult place to make a country out of. Very, yeah. really, you know, we don't really see it here, The but there's enough nuance there. I mean, there are five or six competing cultures, yeah. really, inside yeah, yeah. of the boundaries of that country. And it just makes it very difficult. So are you... Are you like sleeping in a tent? You know, I mean, it, I, the, the, so the reason I ask is because yeah. like there's a super importance to sleep. You talk about all this yeah. preparation. You're nothing without a good night's sleep. Are you like sweating the whole? I mean, no, but by, by the time we got there, I got to be honest. We had these, they called them, I think we called them cans, but they're these little quad cons. It's probably the equivalent of being like a, 
uh, Hallibur- like, Halliburton guy out yeah. in Midland or something yeah. like that. I mean, we'd been there for two years. It's like glamping, what J Dub does. Yeah, yeah, J- mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, that like wasn't a problem. Yeah. But I will say this: we we would always, you know, the the C one thirty guys were there. And yeah, we, they lived with us on the south side, mm-hmm. and so the um the thing that we would always try to do is the fighter guys is you get kind of so combat in general. I think this is probably the case in general for most people. It's kind of a short periods of kind of terrifying or um, um, emotions or exhilaration Mm -hmm. with longer periods of sometimes boredom and kind of just, so one of the things that we would do is even at, even at night, we would try to come in for, it was, you know, we would call it six at six, which was when you came back into the airfield, you needed to to basically hit 600 feet AGL right at the end of the runway at 600 knots, which is probably a little too fast for coming into the break to, to recover the airplane, but it was, we wanted to kind of let everybody know that our squadron was back from sure. a mission. Yeah. So we'd light the afterburners and then break right over the top of the C-130 guys so that they couldn't sleep, especially at night. Oh, nice. I mean, just I wake them it, yes. up, you know. Permission so, for fly by the air. It's you know, that, but, yeah. I Tom, guess a you, this is Tom Cruise, man. Forget no. Tom Cruise. Like, we got the real deal and I, here. I wasn't really all that good at it. Some guys were really good at it. I but, bet, uh, I yeah, bet so. Yeah. Can you, can you tell us about one notable mission you flew over? I mean, I know you're, there's no air-to-air combat, I don't think, but it's yep. more, mostly like dropping bombs and destroying enemy targets, things of that nature, correct? That's right. Any notable missions you could share with us? So I did three tours. First tour was flying, a lot of dropping of weapons. Second tour was actually with the infantry okay. for uh, uh, seven months, coordinating with the guys that were dropping the bombs. And then the third, third time I went over back in the airplane again. Um which yeah, was I mean, the most dangerous of those three? Oh, by far, by far, being First, on the ground. Oh yeah, yeah. But just because of the time frame and that we were, uh, I was with a Marine Infantry Battalion, First Battalion, six Marines, and we were in Ramadi in two thousand six, mm. and it was pretty tough on those. You ever kids. take any 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 shrapnel to the or any shots to the to your plane, your personal plane? We, I think, I don't, you know, I mean, I think we were maybe shot at once or twice, yeah. but I mean, realistically, in a jet airplane, when we were flying in Iraq pretty low threat. Right, right, right. So now, the helicopter guys were really, it was pretty tough on them. The, and that's, you bring yeah. that up because I was about to say like the only reference that guys like me have are the what you see in the movies, yeah. you know, and you Black Hawk down and all that. Are, do those give it the same? I get the emotion from things like that or is it overdone? You tell us like, is that is that accurate or is it like it's far less than that or it's no, it's right there or it's you can't even touch I think Black Hawk Down is probably a pretty good realistic okay. combat movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Since you brought it up. I mean, you see environments, just the environment gives me fear, right? Of just that. Yeah. N- nobody going in or out or anything like that. Just what's going on and the ma- lack of trust. Through, I mean, it's crazy. You it, know? it is crazy environment, but you know, it's also you. Look, it brings those environments, they bring out the worst in people and they bring out the best in people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are moments of levity and it's it's really inspiring you know, you're out there, I mean, I'm probably 27, 28 years old at the time, and I'm with the young Marines, and um, I'm a captain, so, you know, I mean, and these kids are 18, 19 years old. Yeah. And um, they show a tremendous amount of physical courage and moral sure. courage when required. And then the um, gallows humor is great. Yeah. You know, sit, sit, yeah. I mean, you feel like you're uh, amongst a very special group of people w- where you are sitting there... Um, with an 18 or 19 year old kid who's three quarters of the way through a pack of parliament lights mm-hmm. and um, he's pretty tough. Yeah. That's uh, well, it's, hey, it's pretty Clint, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cause oh, no, at no, 27 no. or 28 when I was three quarters of the way through a pack of Marlboro lights, yeah. I wasn't thinking of anything. I, so, I mean, we are going to say that afterwards, but right here, no, I mean, hey, thank you. Hey, look, you I appreciate you saying that. And people say that a lot and, um, and, and it's, it, it makes you realize how great a country we live in. Yeah. And I know it is really sincere. But I got to tell you this and I tell young people all the time. I mean, really, I should be thankful. I had the best job in the world. You know what I mean? A different deployment, different time. But I also did a deployment to the Western Pacific. And mm-hmm. I mean, I'm hanging out on top of the Sophie Hotel at two o'clock in the morning in Bangkok with 18 guys <laughs> after having flown an $80 million airplane halfway yeah. across the Western Pacific. <laughs> oh my Who gosh. gets to do that? Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody gets to do that. Yeah. And so that was, I mean, I was very fortunate and mm-hmm. a lot of fun. So, so you reached the rank of major, correct? I did, uh, I did on active duty. I reached the rank of major. I was out at MOTS 1, as you had mentioned. Okay. I was instructing now, so I'd done some combat time. And I was out in Yuma 
Arizona, great place to live, great people, and um, different different conversation. Just said it's time for me to get out, which is a little how, unusual. How do you end that? How does that end? I mean, do you just walk in and say I'm done, or you have to fill out? I mean, is, is there a story? Yeah, yeah, a little bit of both, and yeah. it's not. You know, the Marine Corps fighter community is not a community. When you get to to that point, it's not a community where you walk. You, you know, you have that conversation with people. And they, and then your superior says, "Oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not. It's not the way it is. Mm-hmm. Sure. And and it can't be that way. It's just not. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the first thing is I can't believe you wouldn't want to do this. And realistically, you're you're a quitter. And uh, and I I get that. I totally get that. Um, because um, it's a high performance organization. Sure. So that's uh, unfortunate, well said. but yeah. we, you know, well Britt and I know you as we know you now yeah. before, after the, all the military service. So I have to believe that there was other factors. I mean, I don't know if his wife and children or you wanted, yeah. you wanted a little more control of your own life, maybe a more stable life. I don't know if that's the right answer, but I, that, that part of it, itself, that's it. it has to be tough. So that's it. So yeah. you join, you join the working world more or less in the normal capacity. Life's changed for you. Is, is this a, I mean, it's gotta be a buzzkill at first. Yes. You know, I'll tell you, um, in some ways, yes, but I was so happy to be back. I'd mentioned to you, my family's cousins, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, the, and by this time, parents and sister and brother-in-law, everybody's back in Texas. And, uh, man, it just felt like we got really lucky. They gave us, uh, gave me orders to Carswell Air, well, uh, NASJRB sure. yeah. Fort Worth, yeah. the old Carswell Air Force, Carswell Field now. And, um Got orders here, went to work for a guy who I'd known who's a mentor of mine. He allowed me to start, uh, applied to business school, uh, went to Texas Christian University mm-hmm. and had a great experience there. We, thought, for we that. thought you probably did, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> horn, horn frogs. You're not wearing your ring. I don't know if we do rings though, but yeah. I can't. Had a great time. Had a great time there. Learned a lot. Needed to. I tell people in 2012, I didn't know what a balance sheet PNL statement of cash flow statement of stockholders equity was had no idea. So, um, and I guess that really gets into, I always feel like people have really taken care of me in my life. And I'm so mm-hmm. thankful for that because, um, I'm, you know, of course that changed pretty quickly, but 12, you probably remember this. I mean, if you lived in Fort Worth and you're a guy like me, you're probably going to go try to work in the oil field somewhere. Mm-hmm. Operations, make the move. Heavy machinery, heavy equipment, yep. working with dudes out in the field. That's what we did. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, uh, and so I was thinking about that. And then um, uh, I got a local guy here uh, who who we had always kind of stayed in touch with, but really had rekindled our friendship since moving back. Asked me to come work with him and his family. And, and that was kind of it. Who, who are we talking about? Tyler Head. Yeah. So, I mean, most, most folks around right here. here would know, uh, Hannah and Tyler and certainly his family. And then, uh, you know, Hannah's, uh, parents, uh, who were the two, probably two finest people I've ever met. Sure. Um, uh, so the opportunity to work for them so was corporate capital. You're there, you're there now. It, yeah. I was right. working with Tyler and it mm-hmm. was, I mean, the best, I'm most, most, you know, in, in, in Fort Worth, it's, I guess, pretty standard thing. It's yep. a, just a small private, privately held direct investment firm. And so, you know, here you go, uh, uh, you, you know, take, of course, Tyler had been out a couple of years before me, really smart guy, uh, business school up in the Northeast, done really well there. And so he was setting this structure up and brought me on to, and so started out doing analyst work and yeah. then that eventually worked into principal work. They gave me a lot of responsibility, um, trusted me a great deal uh be forever thankful for that so i learned Absolutely. what i needed to learn in order to kind of work my way into the job i have now you that's think awesome. a lot of that's stu- due? i mean this is going to sound like a silly question but obviously tyler knew what you had gone through because he had gone through the same thing and a lot of that trust came out of that and how much has that been helpful in your life because you guys are a unique bunch you know there's yeah. no doubt well i do think and i think i mean uh, i mean you guys I don't know. You guys would have your own opinions on this. Uh, that would be probably more valid than mine. But I do think that it becomes, it's becoming increasingly more difficult, unfortunately. But the, it's always the case, man, can I really trust this person? Mm-hmm. Are they going to do what they say they're going to do? Yep. In other words, if it doesn't go right, 
then which sometimes things don't go right. Yeah. Yeah. Then am I hundred percent sure that, that they never cheated for me or they gave really, that's rare, but really that they gave it a hundred percent that, that, that they, they left everything out there on the field, that they did, they did everything that they could possibly do to try to ensure success for the resources that they had been given to steward or manage. Mm -hmm. That's a lot harder to find than I would have initially thought, right. mm -hmm. right. you know, and you guys are successful business guys. So you've clearly found that. Um, and, uh, but, but it can take some time. Yes, indeed. I don't think you ever stop trying to be that, you know, like, yeah. I mean, it, I think that actually our age that we're all mm -hmm. hitting mm -hmm. is where it starts turning that corner where you, yeah. you start really trying to think about that more, you know, I think um, that's important. Uh, you know, it, so, you know, all of the talent, all of the EQ, all of the IQ, all of the, um, you can be the best at anything or everything, you know, but at the end of the day, if you're a sociopath, you're just a sociopath. I mean, right. I yeah. mean and, 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 and so. Did he tell you to say that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he right. did look at you, though, by the way. Just yeah, to, yeah, just to make yeah. sure you. <laughs> Yeah, you shows over. You cut it. Cut you it. Get the profile. <laughs> let's let's yeah. see. So you, you got to the Catholic. Now you're at the Catholic Diocese of Fort Worth Advanced right. Foundation. That's what right. is what is that, and what do you guys do? So we manage the. We do a number of different things, but I think probably most prescient to this conversation is we manage the endowment. We actively manage the endowment for the diocese, which is you know what is a Catholic diocese? So, I mean, I mean, I got to tell you guys before I took the job on and was given a job offer from the bishop, which I'm eternally thankful. Um, I would have probably been asking the same thing. So the, it's a contiguous body or of, of land that's 28 counties, 26,000 square miles, 92 parishes now, 17 schools. So kind of a little school system. But it is the Catholic Church effectively in North Texas. So up to the Red River on the west side of uh, I-35, kind of Denton area, all of Denton County, out to Childress, down to Albany and then kind of down to Cliff, uh, Dublin and then Clifton and then back up I-35 again. So um, that is, you know, we call them investors or, uh, you know, they have donor advised funds. But, you know, all of those entities at different levels have investments that they're making. Right. And so we've pooled all of those and we manage them in a general pool. We have a multi-strat, we call it a multi-strategy or multi-strat, multi-asset class, fully diversified investment portfolio. You got, you got people just like you to the east of us, to the north of us. We do. The so the Diocese of Dallas. Yep. Smaller uh, body of land, but more people. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, and the the largest diocese in Texas is the diocese, Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so when a Catholic uh, school at any level, young, old, around in this area needs mm -hmm. something, needs a, like a building or anything, clothing, yep. books, whatever, do they call you? Do they call? This is is this where the funds come from to do such such things? That's right. So if they've got an endowment that they've set up for those purposes, then they call us, and then we make sure that they get what they need. That's a, maybe a little oversimplified, but that's that's mm -hmm. that's that's effectively sure. You know, so they they not unlike TCU, TCU manages its budget, mm -hmm. and a part of its revenue are the cash flows that it's endowment right. is kicking off. Right. So a similar structure to that. Money so raising is you're the endowment. Yeah. You're the yeah. kickoff of that cash flow. That's right. right. Yeah. And That's is right. money raising a, a, a major player in your, in your career. It is a component of what we do. And um, gosh, Bishop would probably say, God, Clint, don't say that. I'm just not really all that good at it, but we got some great people that are good at it. And we manage a team of advancement and development folks. Okay. Um, we manage all of the development efforts for all the different parishes. So if they want to build a new church, they come to us and we work with them on that and we help them set a program up for that. We run the Bishop's annual appeal. Okay. So uh, very similar to, I'm sure TCU's got an annual sure. appeal or an annual oh, fund. Yes. Same That's interesting you say that because J-Dub and I have been working on a religious concept we'd like to bring to you okay. eventually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Just to kind of, people call it cult. We don't get in, we don't call it that. We have it's just something that, Concept. I don't, I don't know where he's going with that. But <laughs> tell, tell us about the bishop. Tell us about the bishop real fast. Who yeah. is this man? What's he like? If you can. Great guy. Uh, and a uh, real honor to work uh, for him. He would probably say with him. Um, you know, the way I describe working uh, uh, Bishop Olson is the type of he, he salt of the earth, great American. Um, you know, lower middle, grew up in a lower middle class family on the west side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and at 14 years old, uh, entered this high school seminary 
in okay. downtown Chicago, which was probably north of 90% Catholic back then, multi-ethnic, multi, just a very a real melting pot, if you will, of cultures. Um, but I mean, got on a train every morning and kind of knew at 14, that's what he wanted to do. And of course, 15 years later, became a Catholic priest and found his way into the diocese of Fort Worth. Um, great teacher, um, uh, spent most of his time in seminary teaching guys. Um, and you know, you kind of know what you see is what you get. What's he, does he wear the, uh, Roman collar? collar? Yeah, okay. absolutely. But not anything, not anything. Oh else. yeah. No, well, I mean, he could, yeah. I mean, he's, he uh, can dress it up. If he, he can wants. dress, he can dress yeah. it up his dress uniform, as I put it. Yeah. He's, yeah. Yeah. He can, he <laughs> so can you've been do doing this now for three years. Yes. Future plans. Is it just steady, steady to the course, keep the ship going? Or do you have, is there, is there a future expansion plan or anything you can share or, or you know I, I don't know i mean i, I guess we've all kind of got our plans right don't um, lose the money basically uh, don't lose the money yes. first yeah. of all do no yeah. harm right yes. it's yeah, god's money it's don't, god's money you've right. got to be real it careful is. with yeah, it yeah, yeah. You tell that one of our hedge, pressure one yeah. of our one of our guys who used to work at a hedge fund who you know he mm. says you know every time i every time i go to look to make a trade i'm thinking about that person that's putting that dollar in the collection basket and I said, oh yeah that's probably a good thought. yeah yeah it's probably a good good thought to have um who knows uh Right. What I would say right now is it's very, it's a very fulfilling for me in the sense that I am able to, I don't, I don't think about this enough. I should think about it more as far as being thankful. I get to, so being a Marine was very fulfilling. Um, working in finance for great people, um, is fulfilling, but not at the same level as being able to do that for something yeah. bigger, better yeah. than yourself. Yeah. And so I, I do think for whatever reason, maybe I find a lot of, uh, I get a, I just kind of get a lot out of that. So I can't, I love what I'm doing. I can't see myself doing anything different anytime soon, but you know, that's wonderful. We don't really have control over that, I guess. That's correct. You know, at the end of the day, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I got to think you're somewhere close, though, with handling that <laughs> yeah. finances for that guy upstairs. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe <laughs> so. Maybe, yeah, we'll see. Maybe it depends on how I do. Yeah. For, <laughs> yeah. Sure. How many kids do you have? I have one daughter. One She's daughter. 16. Oh, yeah. right. oh so, yes. Oh, yeah, man. The we're just start, never ends. Dude, we just started driving the car. Brutal. And oh, she's, yeah, grandmother gave her a car, which is very generous. Mm -hmm. She's got this little car. Hmm. And she is not. She's very conscientious. <laughs> she'd be she'd die if she knew I was even talking about her. Very, she's very conscientious, but she cannot parallel park. And we're not going to take the test until she can do it. Oh, good, good. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Something tells me you might be able to help her do that. You know, uh, you can pass the test with failing that. I'm just saying, hopefully she didn't watch this. Yeah, but I, but gotta, I thought that I failed it. And then I was super relaxed. Good. And the guy's like, I was like, so I failed, huh? And he goes, no, you passed. He's like, why do you think that? And I was like, because mm -hmm. I hit the cone. Yeah. And it, it, but that was the rumor back in the yeah, day. Yeah, that's right. You know? couldn't, couldn't. Okay, yeah. it's good to know. Yeah. Well, don't tell her that. Though. Okay. All right. As we finish up, your father worked for TechStop for a long time, correct? Yeah, he did. You know, uh, when dad left the Marine Corps after 36 years, he came back right. to Texas, was actually was a vice president for student affairs at Texas A&M for a while. And then the executive director for the Texas De Department of Transportation, which he loved. Right. Did he ever know he that guy over there? You think? Uh, yeah, he think. would. He would maybe say, "Could you get me another cup of water here no. at the commission <laughs> no, meeting?" No. Please. This guy's yeah. a great lobbyist. <laughs> so I'm sure. That's he, how I'm I know. Sure, yes. yeah, yeah. Well, for your first podcast, I'd say you did a fantastic job. Well, thank, thank you, you for being here, Clint. We've enjoyed yeah, looking into you. your life and. What an incredible thing you've been part of. So yeah. Well, sharing. look, guys, thanks for having yeah. me on. This is a really I love your love your podcast. Uh really uh love talking to you two guys. You. So thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. So yeah. we end every show, you know, yeah. um with the best day and no, no family stuff. I mean you first mm. of all, it's really refreshing and good because we've heard so much about how that has helped formulate. But maybe just like the best day of your life when um something and all the things that you've done really stuck out. Sure. Um, you know, I think the best day of my life, I guess is, I don't know if I've ever told this story, but yeah, it's, it's not all that unusual. The best day of my life. So it's with first battalion, six Marines over there on the ground with, the, with, with, the, with the infantry in that in urban environment. In Ramadi. Yeah. And, uh, my daughter was born and I was over there. So she was born on December 27th, 2006. Mm -hmm. And, um, I came home in March. They sent me home like a week early. So I was by myself. I had a piece of paper. I ended up going through 
Bahrain or something like that. And, you know, I'm in utility. It's, I smell terrible. I end up at, getting to Atlanta, Hartsfield. We lived in Beaufort, South Carolina at the time. Mm -hmm. And I come into Atlanta and I know my wife is, is I think it, it was, she was at Wilmington, a little outside field there. She, I know she had my daughter, mm -hmm. never seen her. And, um, and so I show up in Atlanta and I'm waiting in line. I mean, it's like, there's no way. Uh, I mean, I missed the flight, everything. And I'm like, I cannot call. I'm in the United States. I can't call her and tell her that I'm not going to be on this flight. And so uh, I thought about renting a car. At the end of the day, um, I just went up to the lady uh, at the desk and I said, look, I, she's like, I can't, I just can't help you. I was like, look, I've been gone for a long time. I just need you to give me a deal here. Cut me some slack. I haven't seen my daughter. She's three months old. And she looked right at me. She's in the uniform and she said, don't say anything else about it. Cut a ticket, put You're me on an me airplane, cry, mm -hmm. put, put me on an airplane. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was awesome. Best day of my life. So, yeah. And, and we're, it's got to be good because it's even though he's talking about family, it's not just, you know, daughter born. It's actually a really great story. Yeah, so. I mean, it was, well, it was it's awesome. what we all need right now. It's just like that. Like cut me a little bit of slack. Hear just me out. Me some, yeah. And then come on. No, it was, no, you know. she was an, she was awesome. That's an awesome and story. It was great. Well, Clint so, Weber, thank you for joining yeah, us on Fortitude. You, We're honored to yeah, have you, man. Yeah, you and, I, and as yeah. always, thank you for your service. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You. Yeah, That's you Fortitude. Bet. Thank you, oh. Captex Bank. Thanks, and guys. Somebody get Brent in a tissue. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>